Okay, let's go and get started for today. Um, if you have not done lab zero, uh, you should do so. If you have not done the uh, pre-quiz uh, kind of assessment that's posted on the course site, you should do that also. Uh, I have looked at some of those ones that uh, were submitted, and that's kind of going to guide what we're going to do today. So first off, uh, based on the results of that, it was clear that uh, it would be worthwhile to spend a little bit of time reviewing um, some of the topics from last semester. And the essentially what we're going to do today is we're going to get started on that review. So the main point of this review uh, is it should be stuff you've seen before, depending on what section you had last semester. Maybe you hadn't seen some of it before. Maybe you didn't cover it as in-depth as we're going to uh, for the semester. But I want to make sure that we cover all that stuff, fill in any gaps that anyone has, and make sure that we're uh, ready um, for the new material that we're going to cover this semester. So even if you feel confident in what you learned last semester, uh, there might be some additional material in here that you haven't seen before. So I'd suggest you watch these next uh, the lecture today and the next few class sessions to make sure you don't have any gaps in your knowledge. Uh, make sure you're up to speed, ready to go. So when we start doing the new material, uh, you don't, don't see stuff you've never seen before and are confused by that. So go and watch these even if you feel pretty confident in what you've learned. All right, so the review topics that we're going to go over, uh, over the next few classes anyway, are going to be lists and sequences and dictionaries, uh, object-oriented programming, which includes uh, making classes, making instances from those classes, uh, lists of objects, iterating over lists of objects, uh, methods, attributes, uh, things like that. Uh, eventually, after we're done with the review, we're going to circle back to object-oriented programming again. And we're going to talk about a topic called inheritance a little bit. Uh, but for right now, we're just going to get object-oriented programming, uh, a review of that. We're going to review some trigonometry, uh, specifically used to move things, objects around in our game in a, a, a more natural way. Uh, we're also going to then do some physics simulation with that, where the objects can bounce off of walls uh, in a sort of realistic way, have gravity applied uh, to them, have forces applied to them, things along those lines. Uh, we're then going to look at making code modules, and then we're going to circle back to trigonometry again and use it to do some uh, interesting effects kinds of things. Uh, so in other words, some non-physics type things uh, with that. In other words, making objects that kind of uh, don't just go in a straight line, but kind of wander around a little bit. We're going to use it to change the sizes and colors of things. Uh, some really cool game uses. So if you watch a game and there's like a, uh, a glowing health power up that's kind of pulsing uh, red to uh, I don't know, red to white to red to white or whatever, uh, trigonometry can help us with that. And it, along the way, if I notice other things that I think uh, might need to be uh, reviewed, I'll go back and add that as well. So we have the next few classes kind of laid out in front of us here. All right, so let's get started. All right, so sequences and dictionaries are what we're doing today. You can tell that because that's what the title says at the top. And a sequence is uh, basically a way to store multiple data items together. So rather than just a variable like x equal 10, a sequence allows us to store multiple things together. And we've actually seen a lot of these in the code that we've written uh, previously. Uh, so for example, a string, that's a sequence of characters. It's more than one data item has an H, an E, an L, an L, and an O all grouped together as one data item. Uh, colors. Uh, when you're doing stuff in Pygame and you have colors, like uh, in this case red, 255, 00. This is a special kind of sequence called a tuple. It's a collection of three numbers uh, with these parentheses around it in the case of a color. Uh, we've also seen point lists, so a sequence of points. Like when you say uh, pygame.draw.polygon, it expects a sequence of points. Well, you can put those in there inside of these square brackets and say that's point one, that's point two, that's point three. So those are all different types of sequences. A string is a type of sequence. A color tuple is a type of sequence. And a list of, in this case, a list of points. This is actually a list of tuples. That's a type of sequence. You could also have just have sequences of numbers, sequences of strings, uh, really sequences of anything. Now, strings uh, are always a sequence of characters, and we've seen those like 
uh, the player's name or the message game over. Uh, tuples are an immutable sequence of data items. And what immutable means, uh, immutable means not changeable. So in other words, once I create this color as 255.00, it cannot be changed. It could be replaced with a different tuple, but I cannot change this. And the useful thing about that is it allows us to create things that we don't intend to be changed after they're created. Like, for example, the this list of races for uh, some sort of fantasy game, maybe. You don't want to have it as they're playing that suddenly the human class disappears from existence. It's always going to be there while the game runs. There are always going to be five of them. We're not going to add new ones. We're not going to take any away. This is just that. And that's the advantage of tuples being immutable. They can't change. You can't delete things. You can't add things. Same thing with a color. When I find have 255.00, red, green, blue. I don't want to have the ability to add another uh, value to the end of it or take out the uh, 255 and just have 0, comma 0. Colors always have to have three parts. So tuple is probably the right thing to use for that. Now lists are mutable sequences uh, of any data item type we want. So in other words, I could have a list of scores. I could have a list of strings like here with the player names. But as we're going to see after we talk about the object-oriented programming review, uh, next class, you can also have lists of uh, objects, uh, object instances. So you could have like hundreds of bullets on the screen all flying around at the same time. Each one, all of those bullets could be stored in a list that has 100. When they, and because this is mutable, that means you can hit the space bar or click the mouse to fire a new bullet and have it created. That new bullet gets added to the list. The ones that hit the wall or leave the screen get removed from the list. And so Think about lists as uh, kind of a, like a tuple, but you can add things to them and take things away and change the items that are in there uh, as the program runs. Okay, so every one of those sequences, uh, sequence types that we listed, uh, strings, tuples, lists, they all have some special operators that we could use on them because they're all a list of items or all a sequence of items. So let's look at some of those special sequence uh, operators and let's look at specifically the ones that work on all types of sequences first. All right, first off is the in operator. The in operator can tell us if some item is in a sequence. So for example, or the syntax for that is the thing you're looking for and then in and then the sequence you want to look through. So that evaluates as true if this thing for x appears in this sequence s. So here are some examples down here. Is an exclamation mark in the string hello world? And that produces true because it is. That character is in that string right there. Is the word test in this string? Yes, it is. Test is right there. So it's almost like with strings, it's like saying, is this a substring of that? Is it? Can I find that text in there? Like a, It's almost like doing a search and replace uh, in a word processing document or a text editor, you say, hey, find this, and it'll say, yes, I found it. Now, I can also use that on tuples and say, hey, is this number and in this tuple somewhere? In this case, it produces false because 255 is not in there. And here it is with a list, is Ohio in this list of states? Kentucky, West Virginia, Pennsylvania? No, it's not, so that produces false. So in can be really useful. So for example, you might say, uh, try to use a healing spell in this fantasy game. And it might say, well, when I try to use that uh, spell in this fantasy game, if it's not in my, in, or if it's in my inventory, allow it to be used. If it's not in my inventory, pop up an error message saying, you don't have that spell. So in is really useful to say, is something in a sequence? All right, the not in operator works the same way. It's just it inverts the uh, uh, output. So in other words, here are all those same ones there. Is this, is exclamation mark not in this? Well, it is in that, so it's not uh, in that. So that produces false because it is in there. And the same thing for these other ones. So basically it produces true when X is not in the sequence and it produces false when it is in the sequence. It's really just the opposite of the in operator. Okay, the plus or concatenation operator, we use the plus sign and we take two sequences and separate them with a plus sign. That creates a new sequence that concatenation is just sticking one on the end of the other. So one right after the other. 
So we're kind of just like gluing them together to make a bigger sequence. So hi plus there produces the string. Hi there, all run together. Notice it does not add a space. It just sticks this string on the end of that one. And if I have two lists like this and say, hey, what's the list 10, 20, 30 plus the list 40, 50, the plus operator concatenates those two and makes a new list that now has 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. All right, the uh, asterisk or repetition operator, that repeats a sequence some number of times. Now this one, it takes a sequence, use the asterisk operator, and then put a integer after that to see how many times you want it repeated. This has to be a whole number. In other words, you can't put 2.5 there. It doesn't make any sense. But what this does, it essentially just repeats this this many times and concatenates it together that many times to make a larger sequence. So high times five is high, 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 high. One, two times six is one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. And we're actually going to use this repetition operator later on uh, when we go to do some side scrolling, uh, tile based side scrolling games. All right, the length function gives the length of a sequence. In other words, uh, how many items are in the sequence. If we do it on a string, it's how many characters long it is. If we do that on a list, it's how many items long it is. If we do it on a tuple, it's how many data items are in that collection, that tuple collection. It just gives the length of that sequence. All right, to pick an item out of a sequence, we use the square brackets after it. So sequence, square bracket, and then I. Again, this has to be an integer. And that's an index that we put in there. So index zero is the first item in the sequence. Item one is the second item in the sequence. Item two is the third item in the sequence, and so forth. You can also uh, index from the end. So if you put a negative number for I, it counts from the end. So negative one is the last item in the sequence. Negative two is the second to last, and so forth, all the way back down uh, to the beginning. So here's an example down here. Uh, S equal hello. So S sub 0 is that capital H. S sub 1 is the E. S sub negative 1 is the O at the end. It's one. In other words, negative numbers say it's that number of spaces from the end. So 1 from the end. So notice that you can index that anyway. And this, the square bracket notation like this, uh, essentially you can think of that as selecting uh, an item out of a sequence. Now, there's another, one thing to note, this is a, a source of some confusion and the source of some bugs that I see in people's programs, and that's remember that the index values start at zero. So they start at zero at the beginning of that sequence. You could also use, oh, I apologize for yawning. Uh, for some reason, when I do these uh, videos, I talk kind of quickly, and I end up uh, not getting enough oxygen in my lungs and the carbon dioxide builds up and triggers the yawning response. So it's not that I'm bored or uh, sleepy. It's just when I'm in teaching in front of the classroom uh, and interacting with you guys is more time to, to breathe and talk and write and erase and laugh. And so uh, that doesn't happen in the classroom. But for whatever reason, when I do these videos, uh, that tends to happen more often. Okay. The next uh, item up there uh, is that square bracket notation can also be used to uh, slice or select a subrange of uh, items out of a sequence. So, if you, and the way you do that is rather than putting a single number, if you put a colon, it says start with this one and go up to, but not including that one. And these are index values that we put in here. So, in other words, if I say slice from, and these are called slices or range selection. But if in Python terminology, they're usually called slices. So if we say I colon J, that says slice from index I up to, but not including J. If I leave off the one before the colon, that says start with zero, start with the beginning. It's just like if I put a zero there. If I leave off the last one, that means go all the way up through the end. And if I put a third value with another colon, that says step by that many. So in other words, if I put a two there, it would start with this one and then skip one and then get the next one and then give that one, skip one. So in other words, if you put a two, you'd get every other item. If you put a three, you'd get every third item in this range uh, and so forth. Examples for that are on the next page. So here's an example. Uh, my sequence is game over loser. 
0 through 4. Well, let's look at that. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is the space, but the 4, it's not including that. So we get just game. 10 colon. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 is the L. And then the colon says go all the way up through the end. So we get loser. To get over, we can go 5 through 9. So 5 through 9. 9 is the space, but it's up to and not including that. So we just get over. And then if we say start at the beginning, go up through the end, and skip every other one, we get the G, skip the A, get the M, skip the E, get the space, skip the O, get the V, skip the E, get the R, skip the space, get the L, skip the O, get the S, skip the E, get the R, and then we're done. So G, M, V, L, S, R is what we get. And notice that slices uh, work on tu tuples and lists just like they work on strings. Um, I don't have examples of that, but you could slice items out of a, a list of items, a list of names, a list of numbers, or a tuple of numbers. They work on any of that. Same thing for selecting. Selecting, like we had back here, works on uh, lists and tuples just like it works on strings. Okay, the max function finds the largest item in a sequence or the maximum value item in a sequence. Uh, so if I use that on a string, strings are sequences of characters, it'll find the, uh, the character in that sequence that has the largest ASCII uh, code value. If I use it on a list of integers, it'll give me whew, the one that's numerically the largest. And if I use it on a tuple, it gives me the one that's numerically the largest as well. Another one that works just like that is min, gives the smallest one. On a string, it's the alphabetically smallest ASCII character. On uh, a list or a twofold that has numbers, it'll give me the numerically smallest number in that sequence. Okay, so lists are sequences that can contain uh, lists of any other data items uh, that we want to put in there. So to create a list, we basically use the square bracket notation like we see here. See the square brackets? And here I have a list of strings, and I'm storing it in this variable called professors. Here I have a list of numbers, integers. I could also have lists of uh, other lists or other things. So here's a list of team colors, for example. There's the red team, blue team, and this one is red and blue, so it's going to be a magenta color. But notice this is a list of tuples, and each of the tuples has three items. Again, lists can be lists of any data type we want. You can even mix and match them if you wanted to. And here's one that's a list of lists that each list is, has tuples inside of it. Totally fine. So this thing, here's a list. The first item in that list is a list that has these three points where each point is a tuple. And then the second item in the list is another list that has a list of three tuples. So if I were to do the length of triangles, it would tell me two. There are two items in there. But if I were to say, what's the length of triangles subscript zero? What's the, in other words, what's the length of the list that's in the first slot of this list? I'd get three. One, two, three. Okay, now back, we talked about this just a second ago, but we talked about mutable versus immutable. And it turns out that strings and tuples are both immutable, meaning that they can't be changed after they've been created. You could replace them with a new string or tuple. So you could say uh, name equal player one, and then later on in the code you could say name equal, uh, I don't know, like uh, captain, commander, or whatever. So you could do that. You could replace what the variable name is referring to, but you could not create a string like player one and then go in and change the individual characters of it because they're immutable. And Python, uh, the Python interpreter enforces that and ensures that strings and tuples uh, are immutable. Once they're created, they're in memory. They can't be changed. You could throw them away and make a new value for it. But you can't change it in place, meaning you can't add items to it. You can't take items out of it. You can't change any of the items in it once it's been created. Lists, however, are immutable. That means they can be changed after being created. And because lists can be changed, uh, we can perform some uh, operations on them that you...
cannot perform on strings or tuples. All right, so here is a set of list operations uh, or operators of what we can do to them that we cannot do to uh, sequences. So all of the previous stuff works on lists, but now we have some additional things. So additional list operators here. So we can actually go in to, and change an item, add an index to a new value. In other words, we're replacing a value in that list with a new value. We can also say take this slice out of this thing and replace it with something new. And this could be another list or it could be a single value, but this is allowing me to say, hey, take this range of items, take those out, replace them with another range. We can also delete an item. We can take something out, take out the item that's at index i. Or we could delete a whole range of things like trimming out, uh, almost like trimming out a section of video, like editing it. You're cutting that out and collapsing the rest of it down. So if we had five items in the middle of a list, we wanted to get rid of, we could do that delete with a range of them. Those will all go away and the list will collapse down uh, afterwards as if those things never existed. You can also append things to the end of list, add an item to the end of a list. You can remove an item uh, by value from somewhere in the list, say remove uh, the remove player one from the players list. You can also insert an item, which is kind of like a pen. A pen is like an insert that always inserts at the end. Insert, though, allows us to stick it in at a position. So I could say uh, position zero, and that would stick some, make a new item at the beginning. Or I could say, uh, in this case, uh, position negative one, that would stick it at the end of the list, just like a pen does. You could also put five, and it would put it at the fifth position and move all the other ones over. Uh, count. We give it a value. It tells us how many times that how many times that value appears in the list. Sort puts them in a, a kind of sorted order. Uh, if they're numbers, it's numeric. If they're strings, it's alphabetical. And then s dot reverse takes a list that's uh, the beginning goes beginning to end or zero through whatever the end is, and it reverses it. It makes it backwards. So these are all uh, useful. Uh, for lists, and notice we could not use any of these on, uh, well, I guess we could use count because that's not changing it, but this is uh, stuff we can do only with lists. All right, for loops. For loops you've probably seen before and should have used these before, but a for loop allows the programmer to loop through each item in a sequence. It doesn't matter if it's a list or a tuple or a string, you can use a for loop on it. So you can say for and then i in s, so s is a sequence, i is a temporary variable that each, for each item in that list, i is going to adopt the value, it's going to run through the indented code, and then it's going to go to the next item in the list or sequence, and then it's going to do the indented code and go back to the next item in the sequence. So if you used it on the string hello, the first time through the loop code, the indented code, we would get the h. i would be equal to h. The next time through, it would be equal to e. The next time through, L, the next time through, L, the next time through, O. And I doesn't have to be I. You could use any variable name you want. So if you're going through a list of bullets, you could say for bullet in bullet list. And then you could say, hey, bullet.move, bullet.collide, uh, bullet.render, whatever you're doing in that list. And then you would that would go through and move and check the collision for and render every bullet uh, that we have in the bullet list. And notice that variable i is assigned to each item in the sequence one at a time, starting at the beginning, and then going to the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, all the way up until it runs out of items. And the indented code gets run once, or executed once, for each of those items in the list, and we can access them through that variable uh, that's put right here. All right, so here are some uh, example for loops. Uh, I mentioned for ch in hello. I've said you don't have to use i, so this is saying the variable ch, the first time through this loop was going to be h, capital H, and then it's going to be e, and then l, and then l, and then o. And then down here, we've got uh, the same kind of thing, but we're going through this number list and adding up the sum. So we're getting the sum of this whole thing. So we're going through for every value in my number list, say sum, which started at 0, plus equal value. That's going to accumulate. So the first time it's going to be 10. The next time it's going to be 30 because we add 20 to 10. The next time through it's going to be 60. Uh, and then it's going to be 100. And then it's going to be 150. 
And then notice down here, I could, I'm also printing the average by dividing that by the length of how many numbers in that list uh, to get the average, which is going to be 30 in this case. Or, no, that's not right, is it? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So that gives you an example of how for loops work. And like I said, we're going to use for loops later on to iterate through lists of other objects. All right, so the power of lists, and as we see later, uh, or as we will see later, they're going to be very useful. Since lists can store a sequence of anything, we can store lists of game objects in there. We can make lists of sounds. We can make uh, lists of textures. We can make lists of players who are currently connected to the game. We can make lists of levels. We can make lists of uh, inventory items. We can make lists of bullets. We can make lists of non-player character objects. We can make lists of... Uh, uh, particles that we're using to have particle effects like sparks or smoke or whatever. Uh, so tons and tons of stuff. Uh, achievements, quests, uh, high score lists, whatever you want. Lists are a very powerful thing. So we're going to see lists again and again in the code that we write later on. So make sure you have a pretty good uh, feeling for how they work. All right, now, the next topic I want to cover today is... Uh, and really, this is uh, probably the last thing we're going to do uh, today, and then I want you to kind of play around with some stuff and uh, make sure you get the lab zero and the pre-quiz done. Uh, but let's get through the material today, and I'll mention something at the end here. But dictionaries. So dictionaries allow you to store data in pairs, just like a real dictionary. In other words, if you have a dictionary that says, has a word, and then it has a definition that goes with that word. In other words, it's associating a, dif a dictionary definition with the word that you look up. So, for example, you look up, like, I don't know, the beginning of the dictionary, aardvark. That's the key, is aardvark. That's the word we're looking up. And then the definition would be, like, I don't know what the definition of aardvark looks like, but it'd be a long a species of long, any species of long-nosed, uh, are they marsupials? I don't know what they are. Anteater-like species that live in wherever they are. I know it have some other information there. Um, uh, I guess I just proved to myself I don't exactly know a whole lot about aardvarks except uh, what they look like. Um, but the idea there is in Python, we're storing something similar that we have a key or a word, and then we have something associated with that word. And in Python, those are called key and value. So the key is the word that we're using to store the thing under, and the value is the thing we're storing associated with that word. So the key can be any data, data object. The value can actually be any data object. So we're just saying associate this data object with this data object. So the key is used to look up the value. So in other words, I can say, hey, uh, look up the score in the scores dictionary, look up player one score, the score value can be stored with that. Now dictionaries, you create them with, just like you create list with the square brackets, you create dictionaries with curly braces. And the curly braces, uh, you can actually create an empty dictionary. This is a dictionary with no keys and no values in it. Or you could initialize a dictionary that has some keys and values already in them. And this looks a lot like a list when you create a list, but there's one key difference, and that's the colon character in here. So the thing on the left is the key of each colon. The thing on the right of the colon is the value. So player one is in the dictionary. If I look that up, it'll have the value zero. If I look up player two in the dictionary, it'll have the value 100. If I look up player or Paul in the dictionary, it'll have return the value 1337 to me. So once a dictionary has been created, uh, items can be looked up using those key values. So to look up an item, we use square brackets like you do with a list, with a select. But rather than putting a number of an item, you put the string or the key that we want to look up. So in other words, it's saying, hey, in the scores dictionary, select or look up the key Paul, and this will return the value, 1337, in that spot. So, it'll, so that when this runs, it, print, the print will say, Paul has a score of 1337. So dictionaries are mutable, like lists are, meaning that once you've created a dictionary, you can add more uh, 
key value pairs to it, or you can delete ones out of it. So to add a new uh, key value pair, you don't even need to do something like append for a dictionary. You can just say, use the name of the dictionary, square bracket, a name of a key, and then assign a value to that key. So if Jason, which doesn't exist, which it doesn't, right now we have player one, player two, and Paul. So this is going to add a new entry to the dictionary called Jason that has 85 or 8357 stored uh, in as its value. So items can also be deleted from a dictionary by using the key. So you just say DEL and then inside of the scores dictionary, delete Jason. So we create it. So the code createth, the code can also taketh away, just like we have down here. So note if you try to look up uh, an item that doesn't exist, you'll get an exception. So if I, for example, say, hey, in the scores dictionary, uh, print out the score under JSON after I've already deleted it, you'll get an exception that says a key error. And what key error, a key error exception is, it means that thing wasn't in the dictionary. I didn't find that. So kind of like if I gave you a dictionary and I told you to look up the word, I don't know, like Vumpler, uh, <laughs> and you tried looking up Vumpler in the dictionary and you couldn't find it, you would then tell me I couldn't find that. It's not in here. Python does the same thing. If you try to look up a key that doesn't exist in the dictionary, if, for example, if I tried to find the score for the player Vumpler back here, it's not in there, it'll throw an exception and that'll stop your program unless you have uh, error handling around that. We are going to talk about error handling a little bit later in this, uh, not today, but later in a future class. So your program doesn't completely crash and stop. It'll actually, you can handle that and say, that's not there. All right, so dictionaries, uh, you can also change the value stored under a key if you want. So you almost like changing the definition if you want to. So let's say uh, my score back here, remember it was 1337. Let's say I got uh, finished a level, I got some points. I could change the uh, value that's stored under uh, this key by just doing an assignment just like you would to create it. That'll replace the value that's there. You can also get the number of entries that are currently in the dictionary by using length, just like we did on a list. But this is giving us the length of how many items are in the dictionary, how many keys, uh, key value pairs in the dictionary. You can also clear all of the entries from a dictionary rather than deleting them one at a time like we did back here. You could delete all of them. There's kind of two ways you could do that. You could say, uh, use the dot clear method or you could just reassign it and say, hey, the scores dictionary, set it equal to an empty dictionary, and then all of the old one that had stuff in it would go away. And there's not really a, a reason to use one over the other. Uh, I tend to use this second one, but I don't think there's an advantage or disadvantage to either one. All right, there are other dictionary methods as well. Uh, one of them, so let's just quickly take a look at those. Uh, so one of them is has key. And basically what has key does is it'll return true if uh, that particular key is in that dictionary. So for example, if I say has key Jason and Jason has a key in the dictionary, it'll return true. If Jason does not have a key in the dictionary, it'll return false. Now you can also do this dic what it's some dictionary dot keys that will return a list of just the key side of the dictionary uh, entries. If I do dot values, it'll ignore the keys and return just a list of the value side of all of the entries in the dictionary. So in other words, if you think about it as like key value, key value, key value, the first one here is just giving me the keys, key, 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 and it's returning that as a list. And values is giving me that as a list again, but only of the values. Now, dict.items, that produces an iterator for all of the entries, which are in a tuple form with a key value pair. So this is, let, would let you iterate over every key value pair uh, items would. And we'll see that in action here in just a second. Now, there is one other way to see if an item is in a dictionary besides using this has key. You could say just in as well. You could just use the in operator. So I could say JSON in scores underscore dict, and it will produce true if there's a key for JSON or return false if there's not. You can also use not in, just like you would on a list. Okay, 
Now, one of the things that uh, I haven't really talked about, we talked about a lot of what dictionaries can do, but we didn't talk about like how incredibly powerful they are. And we're going to see some of that in the future lectures here coming up. And specifically, what we're going to see here is the dictionary keys and values can actually be any data items. Uh, there, some of them are really useful uh, for gaming related things, which is what we're going to do. Uh, but they're really a powerful uh, tool for game programming, uh, for any programming for that matter. But the, a couple places where you could use this is the, the cool thing about these dictionaries in Python is that it's just a key, which can be any data type, and a value, which can be any data type. Including the value could be a list, or another dictionary, or... Uh, an image or a sound. And so down here we can see that. So the key also being any data type can be useful because that means I can associate things with numbers like this. So I say, hey, matrix 1, 2 equal 15. That allows me to implement something that works a lot like a two-dimensional array where I can fill in uh, these values like this. And now when I go to look up, hey, what's in cell 1, 2? That's a data item. 15 is stored there. Sounds, uh, I start out with an empty dictionary and I can add the explosion one, pygame.sound.loadboom.wave. So I could actually load up all my sound assets into this sounds dictionary under a name. So then when I wanted to play a sound later, I could say, hey, play the sound explosion one, and this would get the waveform out of that and play that. So I could do a pygame.sound.play, sounds, square bracket, explosion one. And since the value was the actual wave form of the sound, the actual sound object itself, that would play. Or I guess it would be sounds explosion one dot play. But then I could say sounds explosion two dot play to give some variance in the thing. But this is a really cool use of that. Also for textures, if I, I could load the textures under a name. And then later on in my code, I could say, hey, uh, display surface dot blit, blit the textures grass, blit the grass texture. And that can be powerful because it can allow us to write code that loads textures in dynamically for different levels, um, things like that. But again, dictionaries are going to be really useful for us to use here uh, when we do that side scrolling thing. We'll see that later on in the semester. Now, to iterate over dictionary keys, there's a couple of methods of doing that that I want to uh, mention here. The first method to, for iterating over dictionary keys is uh, basically just iterating over the key part of it. So for key in some dictionary dot key. So remember that dot keys that gives me a list of just the keys or an iterator that gives me the list of just the key items. So I could actually print all those out. Print key and then look up the value that goes with that. So this would get this for loop here is going to print all of the key value pairs in this entire dictionary. I can also do that rather than saying dot keys, I can just use some dictionary and say for key in that, and that will go through and do the same thing. So these have an equivalent result. So both of them iterate over all of the keys of the dictionary. And then what do we have in the loop here? We're just printing out the key and the value. Now you can also iterate over just the values. So I could say for value in some dict dot values. Now note that there's no way to look up the key based on the value, at least not in a, a way that's built into Python. You, there's a way you could write the code that does that. Um, but right now, note that there's no way to do the lookup in reverse and say, hey, take this value and give me the key. And the reason for that is because it, they may not necessarily be uh, unique. The value There could be the same value for more than one key. In other words, player one could have a score of zero. Player two could have a score of zero. So if you want to say, hey, look up who has a score of zero, there's no real way to tell if it's player one or player two. So, but note that for the key, the keys are all guaranteed to be unique. So it's kind of like a function uh, in the sense that the domain or the keys have to be unique. All right, you can also iterate over the keys and values together as a pair uh, or the items. And you can do that like this. So for key comma value in, and then use the dot items method. So the dot items gives a list of the pairs of the key value pairs, all of them. 
So note within that loop, uh, we don't have to perform any additional lookup like we did in the previous one, that we already have the key and the value for the first item. The second item, we have the key and the value for that one. And notice I'm using the special form of the for loop where I put both the key and the value there because each item has a key and a value in it. So note within that loop, uh, we now don't have to perform that additional look lookup so that by iterating over the items, that can be faster if we're going to use both of them in there than having to look it up again. Also, you can turn a dictionary into a list uh, of tuples by using this list function on the items of the dictionary. And that will produce a list of all of the key value pairs for us. All right, let's, uh, let me switch over to a Python shell and we'll actually just do a couple uh, examples here. Oh, let me switch over to where you can see it. Let me pull that down there. All right, so let's do an example. Let's make a dictionary called D1, and let's set it equal to an empty dictionary. So now I have an empty dictionary. So if I were to say, what's the length of D1? It's zero. There's no entries in there. Now I want to add an entry to that dictionary D1. So D1, square bracket. Let's, let's make this a... Uh, uh, I don't know, let's do uh, state capitals. So let's do Ohio. Oops. So Ohio equal Columbus. So now if I say what's the length of that dictionary, it's got one item in it. So if I say D1 well, let's add another uh, few here. Let's add, um, I don't know, let's add California. Let's say D1 Let's add another one. Let's say North Dakota. I believe it's Bismarck. So now I say, what's the length of my dictionary? I've got three essential words in my dictionary, three things that I can look up in my dictionary. Now, if I say uh, d1.keys, that'll give me just the keys. Ohio, California, North Dakota. If I say d1.values, that give me the values, Columbus, Sacramento, Bismarck. Now, one thing to note that the order that you put them in here might not match the order that they show up here. It stores them in a, uh, a different kind of structure that is kind of like a, a tree behind the scene. We're not gonna worry about that right now. Notice that, but not if, now notice if I do d1.items, that gives me a list of all of the pairs that we put into there. Now, if I want to delete one of them, let, let, let's, add, uh, let's add one more to this. Let's say D1 square bracket, West Virginia, oops, yep, equal Charleston. So, D1 dot items. And I want, I want to show you something here. Notice that, uh, here, let me move that up so you can see it. Okay, so there we go. So one thing to notice here is now I've got uh, five, or one, two, three, four things in my dictionary. Let's say we want to, I want to show you that, remember we had that list? of d1.items notice now it takes off this weird dict items thing at the front and now it's just a straight up list of key value pairs across all of them so let's say we want to delete one out uh well let's add one more and then we'll delete it out so let's add texas so uh, d1 square bracket 
taxes equal Austin. So let's do D1 dot items. And there all of them are. So let's say we want to iterate over this list. And then I'm going to remove one out. And we're going to iterate over it again. So I'm going to do here, let's do a uh, for state in D1. And I want to make this a little bit higher up on the screen because I don't like it to be down in the video unsafe area of the screen in case you're watching this on a smart TV that's cutting that off. Okay, that's a little better. All right, in D1 dot keys. So there's my for loop. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to print out state, comma, D1 state. Oh, I, I, I need parentheses on that. That's a method. So let me try that again. Okay, I'll just copy this. Ohio, Columbus, California, Sacramento, North Dakota, Bismarck, West Virginia, Charleston, Texas, Austin. So this iterated through every one of the keys in the dictionary, and then we looked up the, uh, the state there. Let's do that's that second way I talked about. So let's say for uh, state, comma, capital in d1.items. And now here, print state capital. And notice we get the same result. Notice this is getting both the state and the capital, the key and the value at the same time, and then printing them out at the same time. Now let's delete one. All right, so DEL, in this case, we're going to do dictionary one, square bracket. And let's say uh, Texas finally succeeds in seceding from the, the union. So it's no longer a state, so we need to remove it. So, so we're going to remove the entry for Texas. That worked. And now let's uh, print those out again and say for state capital in d1.items. Print state capital. Now Texas is gone. All right, so that's essentially uh, what we're doing right now. As I said, we're going to use those lists for a lot of different things, uh, and we're going to use dictionaries uh, for a lot of different things. Uh, both of those are very powerful programming uh, constructs to, uh, and data types to understand. We're going to store uh, sounds in dictionaries, we're going to store uh, textures in dictionaries, we can store scores and inventory items, we can do all of that stuff. It's a very useful thing. Just like in your daily life, you might have like a file cabinet. In the file cabinet, you open it up, it's got slots that have labels or folders that have labels on them. Or you might have notebooks uh, that you have for your classes. And this is the notebook for uh, Calculus 2. And this is the notebook for uh, game foundations too. And this is the notebook for concepts of uh, 3D math. And so you have a different notebook for each one and you can open your bag and your book bag or you can say, okay, I need to look up and get this notebook out and then you can add things to it and put it back. And so that's the, the beauty of uh, a dictionary is ability to look things up by some key. And that key could be a name, it could be a number, it could be whatever you want it to be. It could be an object of some sort. And then within that dictionary, you could store lists of items under that, which is kind of like the notebook. The notebook is like a list of pages. Each page has a list of characters and things written on it and so forth. So those are going to be really powerful things. So let's switch back to the presentation just for a second here to finish things up. Okay, so here we are back at the presentation. 
uh, we finished up that stuff. So that's all we're going to do now. Uh, we'll, I might suggest that you want to study the stuff we did today because we might have a little quiz on that next class uh, that'll be posted. So uh, make sure you look at the video and understand the stuff. And what I would, again, I mentioned this at the last lecture, but I'll mention it again. I would suggest you watch these lectures during the normal class period. Uh, generally, they'll be less than an hour, maybe 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes maybe a little bit longer if we're doing a lot of coding and writing stuff. But what I want you to do is get everybody up to speed on these things because you're going to need this stuff in order to write some really cool games. And the conceptually, the stuff we're doing in Python here, you're going to use throughout your uh, programming career. It's really powerful, really cool stuff. So... Uh, I really would like you guys to kind of get up to speed on this stuff rather than waiting until we get into the stuff. So we'll have a quiz next class probably. Uh, at least you should be ready for one. And other than that, make sure you've done that lab zero. Make sure you've done the pre-quiz. Both of those are important uh, for your success and for my success engaging what we need to go back and learn. Uh, so do that. And next class, we'll have a little quiz. Uh, maybe we'll uh, get started on... Uh, a lab next week sometime as well. But that's it for today. Everybody stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask if you're out and about, uh, and I'll see you uh, soon. If you have any questions or problems, send me an email, give me a phone call, let me know.